Good morning. This is Dr. Lori Bodino, and I'm doing collaborative check-ins today with Dr. Mimi Nardi. And I'm so excited for her to share some exciting news today. And Mimi, I'll let you introduce yourself some more. Thanks so much for having me on the show, uh, Dr. Lori. It has been a while since we've had a chance to talk, but like, you know, you're a person who I really love and respect and admire, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. To talk about myself a little bit, I have had, I feel like a cat, <laughs> had many different lives. Yes. Um, as you know, I was a professional athlete for many years, and then after that, I left and pursued a career in academia. And um, just a couple of years ago, I kind of stepped back from my role in teaching. I had a couple of adjunct faculty positions at different universities here in Southern California. And I have been dedicating the majority of my time to our family's nonprofit foundation. And I took up to a hybrid homeschool with my daughter. So I've just been in the midst of a, a few different um, interesting projects. But one that has been going on for quite a while is race, class, and parenting, Absolutely. which is a project that I know uh, that you were able to participate in before. Yes, and I, I was good. I like had to cut you off. I was. I had the most incredible experience with a, a diverse and unique group of women coming together. I didn't know anyone except for you, and just really being able to explore race, class, parenting, and explore our own individual experiences and being able to share our stories. It was such an inviting and necessary exploration to to experience, and so I was so thankful for that. Yeah, you know, I am actually a women's empowerment scholar, and I saw the whole thing as like an intersectional feminist intervention. Mm -hmm. Like, I just wanted to bring together different kinds of women from different backgrounds to talk about social identities and parenting and conversations that really just aren't often had um, between women across racial lines. But mm -hmm. I guess, you know, um, people like ourselves, what makes us unique is our ruthless optimism. <laughs> and so <laughs> we do have that in common. <laughs> and so I was just yeah. really optimistic about the possibilities and what could you know come forth from facilitating conversations like that. And because I had spent so many years in academia, really facilitating critical conversations and opening up different kinds of dialogue um, and engaging different kinds of minds, people from different walks of life, I realized I had an actual skill to leverage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, beyond academia. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why I decided to take my show on the road, kind of in pursuit of other audiences, in pursuit of other audiences to see what could come out of it. So um, part of the product of the four years of that kind of informal research hosting these you know panel conversations and workshops um, has been a book series and the first book is out there about seven strategies for just raising your kids from a stronger social justice perspective and the book that came out last week is specifically about five strategies for discussing social injustice with your kids which is obviously so critical and so timely as we have seen some really painful and egregious acts of uh, violence and injustice. You know, how is it that we're going to frame this for our children uh, in a way that um, helps them to be informed, sensitive, loving, engaged, but also not traumatized um, or disempowered or to, um, I think for us as parents, and for me as a mother, my, one of my number one jobs is to maintain and protect uh, my children's sense of hope. Mm -hmm. And so how is it that we can have these conversations where we still uh, answer that call and we're still honoring that responsibility to maintain our children's sense of hope? Yeah, I, I love how when, whenever I talk to you, there is a full stop, right? Like a period after hope, and it's not a question mark. Mm -hmm. And so often, Often, even in my own journey as a clinician, as a mother, when I say something optimistically, like anytime I see a child's individual differences, their behaviors, I see them as adaptive skills. I see them as asking and searching for a need, searching for meaningfulness. And until they get that meaningfulness, they will keep continuing those, what I call movements, not behaviors, but movements, those interactions. And sometimes I'll find myself saying that the the positive side of it 
And that will be met with this, this statement of like, it sounds whimsical or it sounds like you're not taking it seriously. And yet it's, it's very serious. And also it's like the, and also it's not a, but, and also, um, when we look at optimism, when we look at options and opportunities, then we have, we have a way to go. We have, we have growth. And I know that that's how we learn the, the most when we're open or receptive, right? Versus right. being fearful and, and um, closed off. So I really appreciate that, this idea of this hope, this, this openness. And I, I also wanted to mention that during this time, uh, so many parents are thinking about what is the resource to read? Like, where do I begin? And there's a lot of like grappling to get anything, right? And so it's so lovely to know that you have been doing this. This is, is your life career, one of your many life careers. Um, this is this journey, but you've been doing it and this is your area of expertise. And now, in addition, there's these resources for parents. So would you like to talk about those five tips? Sure. Yeah, I would love to kind of maybe um, at least kind of skim the surface and open the conversation and see what kind of thought can be provoked in the limited time that we have. Yes. Um, I, I think one thing that I really appreciate about you and what you're saying and what I'm hoping that we can cultivate in other mothers, parents, people who are raising children or mentoring children um, is this idea of just being um, like more of a critical thinker and, and a thought leader and finding new ways to conceptualize mm -hmm. different problems and to focus on how, to focus on how. Mm -hmm. And I think unfortunately what we have is a lot of people, even right now in this rush for information, Mm -hmm. They're not taking the time to pause and really think of, think about, you know, the how when it comes to the delivery of this information. If we're interested in sustainability, it's not just so much about knowing a bunch of things, but it's about knowing how to know things. And a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to give a commencement address where I talked about this with people that I think what I saw, you know, with students that were undergraduates when I was teaching is like an obsession with the idea of knowing things. And I just wanted to, you know, relieve them from their misery and let them know you're never really going to know that much. That's just the way life works. And I told him, if you don't think that I know what I'm talking about after class, please walk by the library and look at all of the books you'll never read before you die. We're just not going to know all of the things. Like that's just not even a worthwhile pursuit in life. What's really important though, is knowing how to know things and being able to access multiple epistemologies or multiple different ways of knowing so that we can all pursue kind of greater truth in our individual lives and greater truths mm -hmm. as communities and as societies. Right. So for this book and for all of my, um, you know, the things that I write and try to contribute, it's really more about coming up with some sort of conceptual frameworks for us to process and filter and integrate and synthesize information for our children, for our families and for our lives. So that's kind of the point of view that I come with and the intention that I set when I am writing these kinds of, um, these kinds of books to, uh, to assist people in their process. Yeah, it's important to give that permission for families to, or you know, individual parents to know that they can slow down, to drop into themselves. That that the learning and that that integration of the knowledge, that how, can happen even in our own homes. Yeah. So sometimes we're seeking so much information outside, and I definitely want people to seek out this book and, and learn from it. At and at the same time, so when we care for ourselves first then we can care for our families, we can care for our community, and it goes on and on from there. 100%. And I had another interview that I did earlier this week where I had, uh, I was talking about allyship, and I had drawn the analogy between, you know, engaging and embarking on a process of allyship to a yoga practice. And it is a practice, and it is not something that you can, you know, I'm not going to go to one yoga class and be a yogi. It's a complete lifestyle, and it's something that should permeate all different aspects of my life. I'm going to make imperfect progress. Some days I'm just gonna go just to be there. It's not gonna be like my best performance, right. but it is a journey that we are embarking on. And I've been saying, it kind of reminds me of the Bob Marley song, Love is My Religion. It is a practice, it is something. And that is really what we need to start by dedicating ourselves to 
figuring out our why. Why is it that this matters to you? Why does it matter to you as an individual? Why does it matter to your family? Developing that vision of the world that you believe in and finding out who you believe yourself to be in the process of bringing that vision about. So that's kind of like the preamble to this conversation okay. on how we're gonna discuss this social injustice with our children. And the first strategy really has to do with pre-assessment. And I wanna address one question that, that comes in everybody's mind, which is, you know, are my children too young to have this conversation uh, about social injustice? And truthfully, I am very passionate about being uh, sensitive to where each child is in their development. And I don't think that it, it is wise or sensitive to kind of, you know, tell very uh, violent details about different kinds of uh, situations that happen. It's just not appropriate in the same way that we wouldn't take, you know, a seven-year-old to a rated R film. Yeah. It's not uh, appropriate to, for some of the stuff, especially recently, you know, unfortunately the murder of George, George Floyd, that's not the kind of thing that a child should be viewing or really be hearing about. Um, so, with it's that, a very helpful analogy that that idea of the rated R and thinking about that, right? And giving permission that it doesn't mean we don't have to talk about the the message. And so I'll let you continue. One hundred percent. So I just think that this is just a way for us to kind of use our own kind of uh, parental instinct when it comes to protecting again the safety and ultimately kind of leads back to that idea of the hope. Um, within our children. So we want to be careful about how we are delivering this information. However, all children are really um, old enough to begin to have conversations about justice. Uh, these ideas about justice and fairness and social injustice and, and loving each other and how some people sometimes are harmed or targeted be, for a variety of different reasons, whether it has to do with skin, co skin color, gender, sexuality, or religion. So mm -hmm. these are conversations that can be introduced and should be introduced primarily because our children are experiencing racial socialization, whether you are actively leading it or not. <laughs> so I was on a phone call the other day uh, with a group of parents and educators, and um, there was a woman who was Caucasian on the call, and she, it was a very safe space for conversation and communication. And she was vulnerable enough to share that her concern is that her daughter's about six years old. And it's really painful that her child could, um, her innocence would be compromised right now with all of what's going on, which I understand. And the reason why I think it's so important to have these safe conversations is so that people can really share their truth so that we can actually help them really work on the mindset that's going to help them <laughs> get to the next stage of their process and development. So since she was able to share that truth in a safe space, what I was able to kind of help her understand is that her child's innocence has long since been compromised. Her child is being socialized to be complicit in an unjust system because bias is the default and inequality is the status quo in our society. So really, she has to see the process of engaging in this work, this allyship, this communication with her child is restoring her child's innocence mm -hmm. as actually a restoration of innocence. Mm -hmm. So as babies as young as six months old are already able to perceive differences in skin tone and facial features, if your child is exposed to a wide variety of people, they're going to have a greater inclination for tolerance naturally as their brain synopses are forming. So all of these things are happening from six months, you know, you see what's happening by three years old, four years old, mm -hmm. and at, at very young ages, children are already receiving messages about the way the world is. Yes. yes. And so it's important for us to take the lead so that we are actually parenting to our intentions. A lot of people have great, beautiful intentions, but they're not really empowered and sometimes just not thinking critically enough about whether or not they are parenting to what they say they believe. So for example, the case of this woman, she's really passionate about trying to maintain an innocence in her child, but really she's not thinking critically about what is truly eroding the innocence mm -hmm. uh, in her child's experience. Mm -hmm. So 
that's kind of the first bit about just understanding where your, you know, how age is a factor uh, in these conversations. Right. And, and I think the next thing that's kind of related, because like I said, this first step is just kind of a pre-assessment. The next step is to ask yourself, do my children own multiple narratives of the marginalized group? So in this case, we're talking about race, you know, right now. There are many different kinds of marginalized groups, but in the conversation about race, the question before you start talking about and offloading all of this trauma and oppression is do your children actually own a wide variety of narratives about the marginalized group? If they don't, then you could be inadvertently dehumanizing <laughs> the marginalized group that you're focused on because you know nobody experiences only oppression and powerlessness at all times. That's just not the case. So all people, all individuals, and all groups of people experience both power and powerlessness. That is a human experience in life. And so your children need to have sufficient context before you start opening up conversations about just injustice and oppression. Does that make sense? It does. When you're saying that, I'm imagining some parents thinking about, again, that, that rushing feeling of like, go out and grab the books, the, the dolls, the materials. Um, and I am hearing from you a different level where you're talking about just the expansion of the narrative, the, the stories, the experiences versus just having the, the materials of it. Is that accurate? That is exactly what I'm saying. We need to have multiple narratives because there are truly multiple narratives of the Black experience, you know, in this country and around the world. And in order for us to have an authentic compassion, we need to see other people um, as completely whole and human. And the, you know, the dynamism that is part of the human experience that we are all going through. Yes. So then it, it's not just a one story of one type of person. Right. Whatever that may be, ability, class, religion, age, it's that every individual, we have all their different stories and that we're seeing it from all different lenses. Yes? Exactly. Okay. All different kinds of perspectives, you know. It's on not the one size fits all. Exactly, exactly. And like I said, and that is kind of the um, beginning of the extension of humanity or ethical consideration. Mm -hmm. When you have a single story, and mm -hmm. I encourage everybody, I've encouraged everybody to watch the TED Talk on the danger of a single story. It is a mm -hmm. beautiful... Um, a piece that I often direct, even I have directed my own students to, but I direct people to, because it really kind of challenges us to think about the way that we um, focus on single narratives and how it can be harmful and disenfranchising. Um, and, and it doesn't reflect, like I said, it doesn't reflect uh, reality. Right, right. What's so, what's so beautiful when you talked about that child's innocence, I, I think that there's such truth in how innocence is this expansion of creativity, of knowledge, of, of seeing something from all sides. And so when you're saying that that actually gives a child more of that flexibility and, and life, you know, that's the liveliness of the child, that innocence exactly. we're talking about. I don't see it as being naive. I see it in innocence, meaning they're like vibrant and joyful and they're exploring. And what if they don't explore anymore? What you're saying with all these narratives is like they get to explore even more. Exactly. That's so beautiful. Explore so beautiful. even more. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad that resonates with you. And I think, uh, so a second quick strategy is just really um, developing empathy in your child by relating um, the narratives that you're sharing to common histories, uh, people from other kinds of experiences and walks of life. Because again, what I'm emphasizing is all people experience power and powerlessness at different moments in history, at different moments in their own personal lives. You know, as an individual, there are moments where I've been greatly empowered and moments where I've been greatly disempowered. And so I think that it's really important to draw the connections, you know, for all children between what's happening in this situation. And, you know, you can look at the oppression of black people in the United States, that historical oppression. You can compare it to the oppression of uh, like Italian people in the United States when they first immigrated. You can compare it to the oppression of Jews, to the internment of uh, the Japanese or Asians. So I'm like, there's, it's just a way of helping 
again, bring a kind of humanity because whenever you isolate a narrative, even if you isolate a narrative of a people, not just an individual, but of a people, it is in fact um, inadvertently dehumanizing. And what I'm really concerned about is un like unintentionally imposing a social hierarchy right. when you're telling these narratives and telling these stories. And if it seems that, you know, you're always kind of telling a story or, or consistently telling stories where you have black and brown people at the bottom of this social hierarchy, because children aren't as sophisticated as we are as adults, inevitably you are going to be imposing this social hierarchy. And so it's funny because I have on my YouTube channel a video about why I'm kind of opposed to Black History Month for this very reason, you that I actually sense. think we are inadvertently, I think, imposing, it's a point source for systemic racism because right before children hit nine years old, which is, um, you know, research shows is a developmental marker where their view of the world is pretty much fixed. And outside of a life altering experience, they don't really adjust their thinking in terms of social hierarchies. Mm -hmm. If men and women are equal, or if men are situated above women, or if white people are situated above people of color. So right before they hit that critical milestone, we have this instruction in school, institutionalized instruction, where we talk about only one kind of specific population and the impression experienced by that one specific kind of population. We don't even talk about the Holocaust. It's not a part of elementary curriculum. So it is, to me, extremely disenfranchising um, and, you know, often, as an aside, the delivery of that curriculum, I have many critiques over the way that is even delivered in the first place, but just, you know, to kind of stay, take a step back and critically look at what was the intention and are we actually moving ourselves towards the intention or away from the intention with the way this is being implemented? When you're, when you're talking, it's stripping away the stereotypes and the fear um, that I think so often comes with this topic, even as a white woman uh there's a lot of fear of what if i think this way or what if i start thinking about other populations that this has happened to there's a lot of of questions that that i am left with and i know that i hear from families that they're left with and by hearing again just going back to those narratives it allows some more opportunity to see this as a bigger mission to support justice right. and to support one another and that hope and it's so funny because my third strategy, <laughs> it's like it plays perfectly into yeah. it. It's almost like you read the cue card. Mm -hmm. The third strategy is to determine what is absolute, what is fluid, and what is relative. Mm. And so this is, you know, again, framing these conversations for your children. The right to life, the right to liberty, the right to pursue happiness is an absolute. We live in a constitutional democracy. The right to due process is an absolute, okay? And so also for yourself, within your own families, um, you will have, based on your own family culture, your religion, whatever it is that you're practicing, other things that are absolute. Yes. So in conversations with my children, that is a really important thing because they're, you know, we're, there's nowhere to go uh, with a situation, for example, like uh, the George Floyd thing, because right to due process is an absolute. <laughs> so there's nowhere to go. It doesn't matter who he is or what he, you know, may or may not have done or, you know, none of that matters because we have absolutes that we are holding firm in the conversation. Yes. So I think it's really important to define what those absolutes are as you are opening up this conversation, especially with older children, so that we can really understand what it is that we're talking about and really have a proper litmus test for our values. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the second thing, like I said, is what is fluid? Race itself is a fluid construct. And so, you know, who I am as a Black woman in Los Angeles in 2020 is really different than who I have been in, you know, Ghana as a Black woman in the late 90s when I was playing soccer. So mm -hmm. I think um, race is a very real construct, but it is a social construct. And like I said, there is fluidity. And the reason why I think it's important to impress that upon your children as you have these conversations is because um, knowing that it is a social construct provides an opportunity for us to modify the construction. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> right, right. so knowing that it is not essential 
Yes. It's not even truly biologically essential because to be extra nerdy, um, the, there's more statistically significant difference between people within a racial group than between racial groups. So um, it's not, you know, it doesn't, it's not a, a concept that really holds true even biologically race. Right. Um, so, so like, helpful. <laughs> that's, right, right, that's right. so beyond helpful. And just the, the idea of fluidity that, that all of this is ever evolving and changing. I, I know that, you know, I, I lived in Ghana for, for a month. I, I, I could have li li lived there forever. Um, <laughs> I had to come back for family. Um, but just that there are so much uniqueness within a small town, right. within a, a population. Right. Yeah. So I think it's really important, like I said, to be able to give your children the tools for critical thinking on what is absolute and what is fixed, what has some level of malleability and what has even more malleability, which I think are the things that are relative. And I, um, you know, when I frame this with my children, I talk about privilege as being something that's really relative. Mm -hmm. And so I think that these are helpful constructs for us to uh, begin to look at and to embark on these conversations with our children in a way that is going to give the conversation legs mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, let the thoughts and the changes and, and the movements be more sustainable. Yeah, it's so in line with, uh, this is what we can collaborate together. It's often in line with even how I support parents in terms of looking at challenges or looking at family agreements or intentions of these right. like three baskets and really giving an opportunity to sit down with your your others your spouse or then other care providers and really thinking about these baskets of these like this is the the no like this is the the absolute pile that is really important to our family and and right. who we are and then the middle that that ever evolves and changes and then the the freedom place the the yeses and right. with those categories and they can keep evolving, but it allows real meaningful connection and real meaningful learning because it's clear and the child understands it. It's not because we said so, or this is the way it's done. It, it's very understandable. Right. And, you know, frankly, um, racism in, in the United States is not a 100 level course. <laughs> I keep saying that it's not a 100 level course. There are so many different kinds of prerequisites that you would have to engage in before you could really have a sophisticated conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think that just out of respect for the sophistication, we have to overlay, like I said, some sort of structure to the conversation mm -hmm. so that we can allow, there are so many things that are fluid and relative and so if we don't um, create space for that, we're not gonna be able to have an authentic or accurate portrayal of the problems or to be able to come up with the creative and sustainable solutions, you know, at an individual level, a family level, community level, national level even. I'm so, admi I'm admiring how, um, how much you can speak to this. Like it feels like mm -hmm. such a knowingness. It seems so clear when you speak. Which is so funny because again, I'm not a race scholar. <laughs> I'm not a race scholar, which is really interesting, but yeah. probably really important. I am an interdisciplinarian. I'm a professional generalist. And I have just had the experiences and the opportunities that have helped me to pursue many different kinds of useful epistemologies, yeah. ways of knowing and ways of understanding, you know, how to grapple with intersectional problems. Like I would even say that sports is an epistemology. Sports is a, is a philosophy. It's a way to understand life. You know, religion is a way to understand life. Their science is a way to understand life. These are so many different ways that I've been able to consider life problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it has helped to, again, give me frameworks that have legs that I think are applicable to so many different kinds of, you know, situations. And I see the importance of trying to communicate this with other people so that they can be more empowered to grapple with, um, like I said, really com complicated, complex things. And, and I don't know, you know, otherwise I, I'm concerned how will people be able to even engage or digest or, you know, or not be intimidated. 
uh, by the multiple layers that are that are here. So that's kind of what, like I said, what I've always been passionate about. And I think that right now the audiences are forming uh, even more so than ever because of the, the level of crisis that we're in. Yeah, and, and that we've been able to, <clears throat> we were demanded to, to, to look inwards, to slow down, to pause. Right. And, and yeah, the fourth strategy is really about optimism and being optimistic. And as I said, you know, I have a ruthless optimism. I'm very, very passionate about it. I think it comes from this experience playing sports. Every athlete becomes well-developed. If you play, especially to a high level, you become well-developed in the skill of optimism. And optimism is actually a skill, I believe. Yes. And so, you know, that's what you need to come back in a game from a deficit is optimism. If you have an injury to do the work to come back from that injury, even if you're winning a game, it still requires a cautious optimism to go ahead and lean into that lead and win. Right. And so I just think um, it's really, really important for us to develop that skill of optimism within our children and kind of even make sure we're framing these conversations on uh, social injustice uh, through that lens of optimism. And I don't think it makes sense to diminish the progress that has been made. We can still at once, at the same time, acknowledge the truth of, you know, some things that are very egregious and serious and painful. And we can acknowledge the, the distance we still have to go, but not deny how far we've come. Mm, I love that. I love that. And we know that when we have optimism, I know we they kind of looked at this at the beginning, but you get to drop into that rest and digest state, that parasympathetic nervous system, and then the learning happens right. and connection happens. So I, I can't stress that enough that everything you're saying really parlays into this, this mental health and emotional state of, of all of us that's needed. And I'm not surprised at all that you would find connections because again, from my point of view, there are just these universal truths mm. And we're just accessing them from different um, directions or through different ways of learning, through different studies. And anything that you kind of dedicate yourself and pursue, I think, to you invest enough time in, it's going to bear out the same truths. <laughs> that's, that's just, you know, kind of how I see the world. So, yes. I, I, yeah, I think that it makes perfect sense that, you know, even some of the frameworks that I'm sharing for this are frameworks that you're using in another capacity. Yes. Um, yeah. And then the fifth thing, just to wrap up quickly, yeah. is just uh, acknowledging your own limitations. And I think and it's really important to do that and even to model that uh, honestly with your children, that the process of learning is messy. You don't know everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know everything. Don't tell my husband I don't know everything. <laughs> but we're not expected to know. What we're really trying to do is, like I said, model for our children, what does the process of learning look like? What is the process of committing ourselves to something that we think is really important and brings value to our own personal lives and our community? We're not going to know, we're going to mistake, make mistakes, we're going to make errors, we're going to have insufficient information. Can you show your children how they should address situations where they kind of reach a stumbling point? or where they reach a dead end or a wall. Do you have you know, good mentorship in your children's life? Can you show them what that looks like? Like, hey, I've you know, done research to this point. I'm still not really understanding this concept. Look, look at how I reach out to a friend for deeper understanding or for greater knowledge or for you know, even anecdotal evidence. Right. So I think that's kind of the final thing is that not being hindered by the fear of making a mistake because you are going to make mistakes in the process. Like, let me just erase the fear and give you the certainty of, yes, you are going to make mistakes in the process, but it doesn't make the entire journey uh, invalid. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's- I'm so glad you, you came to this fifth area because even as you're talking, I was thinking about this idea of differentiation, this need for parents to look inside and say, what's my learning? What's my experience? And what am I placing on my child versus it's actually coming from my child? And being able to be vulnerable as a parent and open, we're not throwing our emotions on them, but also being human to say, we can be authentic. And, and oftentimes a parent will say, 
you know, we're not supposed to raise our voice. We're not supposed to do these things. We're not supposed to show our worst self, or I don't want to talk about this with my child because, um, you know, that, that may upset them. And I often explore similarly this idea of it's, I would rather recommend authenticity right. and exploration than a, a one-sided view of, of having our children see something that, that isn't our truth. Um, so I really believe in being a truth teller. Yes, this so, authenticity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This authenticity is so important and so valuable because that is how we self-actualize. So that's kind of how I see it. That's when we can be truly authentic, we have self-actualized. So, um, you know, that's, those are kind of the cliff notes for this kind of Incredible. creepy book. Again, to just begin to open up a conversation and for us to begin to think about how can we uh, do the work parenting from a stronger social justice perspective, having conversations that we perceive as difficult but important. And just being empowered to to be able to do that. Thank you so much. How can we find you? My Instagram account is at mompetitor, like competitor. At race, class, and parenting is also a page that exists with lots of information and tools for parents. And you can also just go to miminarte.com, M-I-M-I-N-A-R-T-E-Y.com. Mm -hmm.